Hi, everybody. My name is Becca Thomas, and I'm here to talk to you about injury prevention in state health departments. Uh, this is a field I've worked in for about 15 years now, providing technical assistance to the health departments across the U.S., and now I do work in the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. But I'm here representing myself and my experience working with these health departments. Uh, one of the things I want you to brace yourselves for is the amount of variability from state to state when it comes to injury and violence prevention programs. So this is definitely a high level overview of some key things that you should be aware of, and it's not comprehensive, but it should get you started on your journey with state health departments. So typically in a state health department, there's a variety of topics covered in injury and violence prevention, ranging from unintentional injuries to interpersonal violence, things from poisoning and transportation safety to suicide and non-suicidal self-injury, interpersonal violence like community, youth violence, bullying. And sometimes we also look at injuries by the outcomes that they produce. So whether that's death, disability, overdose, concussions, or traumatic brain injury, it varies greatly. And also the structure of the programs in the state health departments can really vary. Sometimes in in these departments, you'll see the injury and violence prevention programs to come together in a division or a unit or a bureau. That's how we're structured in Massachusetts. We have the Division of Violence and Injury Prevention. But sometimes they're built into programs and services across a lot of different divisions and programs. So you might have something in uh, with your maternal and child health programs in our um, bureau. The sexual and domestic violence work is separate from the youth violence work. So it really is a lot of variability. One thing that you can do is check out the Safe States page on injury violence prevention contact information, which gives a, a, a hint as to who's the lead for those programs in each of the states. And then you can explore how it's structured within the state that you're looking to learn more about. Typically, some of the strategies that we use in state health department are things like surveillance. This is where our epidemiologists come in. And it's, uh, this is a really important piece of keeping our finger on the pulse of the trends uh, uh, that are related to injury and violence. Uh, another piece is policy input and regulatory oversight. So this is usually where a lot of the, the weight of a Department of Public, Public Health comes in with that regulatory oversight piece. Um, however, there's a lot of caveats around the policy input piece where typically in a state health department, uh, either the funding source or the structure of the department doesn't allow for advocacy. So the policy input is very high level. We also do a lot of procurement. This might be a new term for you. If you're considering a career in state health departments, I definitely strongly uh, encourage you to get to know a little bit more about procurement. Procurement is the process by which we get programs and services. So it's how we determine who gets what kind of funding. There's a lot of power behind procurement. Procurement sets up contracts and scopes of work that allow state health departments and other funders to determine how programs are executed at the local level. So one, you have to have funding in order to do a procurement, but two, it means that at the state health department, we're not usually doing direct services we're overseeing a body or an entity that does those direct services. And the way that we get those services in place is through a procurement. We also do a lot of communications work, whether that's awareness campaigns or social media work or fact sheets, data dissemination, et cetera. Communications is definitely a strong component of our strategy. And we provide training and technical assistance. When you work in public service, you get all sorts of different questions that can come your way. And it's, it's part of your responsibility and duty to follow through and follow up with those folks so that you can share the information that you have about what regulations are in place, what training opportunities exist, what are the answers to these questions. I can't tell you how many times a year I get questions about playground safety or infant safe sleep or a wide variety of topics. We also do a lot of coalition building and partnership building. So this is another place where working in a state agency, you see a lot of other state agencies who have overlapping mandates or tangential mandates to what we're working with. For example, if you're working with um, a Department of Youth Services or a Department of Children and Families, uh, they have a lot of insight into the needs of the community. 
Um, also working with schools, so departments of uh, um, secondary education, um, and even your advocates and allies on the ground, your community-based organizations. So pulling those people together so that we're all aware of the same issues and working towards the same goal um, is, a, is a very strong uh, approach that departments of public health can take in furthering injury and violence prevention. A couple of sample programs and services from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health are things like youth sports concussion laws and regulations. So just about every, I think it might even be every state in the United States now has a youth sports concussion law. And usually when a law is passed, then you have to have regulations backing it up. So here in Massachusetts, we oversee, my, my team oversees those regulations and we provide a lot of communications materials so that schools and um, interscholastic associations uh, athletic associations are aware of what the regulations are and what the best practices are for managing sports concussion. Almost every state, or I believe every state, has child fatality review as well. We run a lot of awareness campaigns, as I mentioned, so you can see one of our posters for our infant safe sleep awareness campaign. Uh, we oversee the Poison Control Center, and we do zero suicide and safe spaces. Another resource on this screen is one of the data briefs that we produce. This one in particular is about um, crashes among young people in Massachusetts. And partnerships, I mentioned that coalition and partnership building component. This is really important. So the, this is just a smattering of the types of partners you might expect to see at the table when you're working for a Department of Public Health. Other state bodies are really important, like for example, Department of Conservation and Recreation, Disability and Rehabilitation Services, Children and Family, Mental Health, Fire Services. The list goes on and on. This is certainly not a comprehensive list, um, but looking around at your state or the state that you're interested in working on and figuring out who those other key players are is an important piece to the injury and violence prevention puzzle. There's also NGOs and nonprofit organizations like Safe Kids Coalitions, um, state and national organizations, advocacy organizations, and then medical providers, because we know that these injuries often end up at the emergency department or in the hospital or even in the morgue. So working with our medical providers to understand their perceptions and what they're seeing to help further the prevention of injury and violence is very important. There's a lot of different funding sources out there. I have to say for unintentional injury prevention funding, it's slightly limited, but basically um, there, I'm, I've separated these into three main buckets. The first being federal funds, second being state funds, and the third being private partnerships. How injury and violence prevention is funded in any given state will vary greatly. So this is just a high level smattering of some of the opportunities that are out there. Um, for example, the Health Resources Services Administration, HRSA, uh, provides the Emergency Medical Services for Children grant, the Maternal and Child Health Block grant, and the TBI State Partnership Program. The CDC provides the State Injury Prevention Program, uh, several different opioid funding streams, the National Violent Death Reporting System, Suicide Prevention, Rape Prevention Education, and Essentials for Ch Childhood among many other funding opportunities as well. And SAMHSA uh, provides substance abuse treatment and prevention block grant, as well as the Garrett Lee Smith grant, uh, which is a youth, viol a youth suicide prevention program and a few other services as well. State funds are frequently or almost always set by the state legislature. Um, and they're typically focused on programs and services um, with no budget for staffing or administration. That might be true in the case of Massachusetts and not other states, but often we have to use a combination of funding sources from federal and state to make sure that we have appropriate staffing as well as ability to implement programs on the ground and work through that procurement process. Some states are able to work with private partnerships as well. Um, some states can't. So if your state has a public health trust fund or some other kind of um, uh, trust fund ability, you might be able to work with a university or some other nonprofit organization, some other entity that's able to give you funding. For the most part, the departments of health receive federal or state funding and pass it out into private organizations and community-based organizations or even other state agencies. Uh, we don't usually see the flow of funds back to the state health department from private entities, but there are rare cases where that happens. 
core competencies core competencies for working with an estate health department. This is very much my own personal opinion, things that have served me well and the people well around me that I work with. Um, number one at the core of this is really patience. When you work at a state health department, it's the long game. Um, nothing changes in a year and that's a good thing. We don't wanna see a complete overwrite and rehaul of, of budgets and laws and programs and communications campaigns on the turn of a dime. These are slow moving container ships, if you will. So patience is really the name of the game and having that long-term vision in mind as you're working on your programs will go a long way. But other skills that come in handy on top of that patience are grant writing and reporting, contract writing and management, especially related to that procurement process I was talking about, data interpretation, really seeing that data and, and deciding what can and should happen to address the issues that are coming up in the data. Communications, program, program administration, like budgeting and um, documentation, et cetera, um, research and coalition building and partnerships. Finally, just a quick smattering of some of the technical assistance providers that work in this space. There are a lot of them out there that can help provide you advice and guidance if you're starting your career in a state health department, or even if you've got many years in the state health department under your belt and are looking for new and innovative approaches. The Safe States Alliance, which you're already aware of, is an excellent partner for, for exploring opportunities in injury and violence prevention. There's also the Children's Safety Network, the Tribal Training and Technical Assistance Center, and many other different, um, different technical assistance organizations that can help you on this journey. I hope this very high level overview of working in a state health department on injury and violence prevention was helpful for you and good luck in your career.